For those of you guys watching online right now from coast to coast and across the Fruited Plains, my name's Joe. I'm the Brigade Chaplain at the 596 Transportation Brigade out of Southport, North Carolina. Ironclad Surface Warriors and a very Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. Colonel Blackader and the entire staff I uh, want to wish you guys a very Merry Christmas. And I also want to acknowledge, um, you know, Christmas can be kind of a difficult time of year for a lot of people. And if it is for you, if, if you're one of those people that it's just, it's really hard, I would encourage you to reach out to somebody. You can reach out to me. You can reach out to the SDDC chaplain. And if chaplains, if, if that's not your thing, that's okay. Um, but I encourage you to talk to somebody. We say it all the time in the Army. There's no such thing as lone rangers. And as a Christian, I believe that's doubly true, that God made us for community. And so I would encourage you, don't, don't try to like just bury this stuff. If something's going on, you need to talk to somebody, please talk to somebody. And with that, I hope each and every one of you guys have a very Merry Christmas. Um, please take a second and pray with me. Lord, we love you. Thank you for loving us. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here to preach uh, this Christmas message. Lord, we think of President Biden. We pray that you give him wisdom and discernment. We pray for a special grace in his life. Uh, we pray, Lord, for our soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, Coast Guardsmen, those serving uh, in the Space Force. Lord, uh, both at home and abroad, we pray for their safety. We pray for their protection. We think of the persecuted church. We think of Leah Sherabu being held by Boko Haram in Nigeria because she's a Christian or Pastor Yusuf imprisoned in Iran because he's a Christian or Pastor Wang or Pastor John in prison in China, Lord, because they're Christians. We think of the Christians, Lord, in North Korea, in the South Sudan, in Eritrea, in Nigeria, in some of the most difficult places, Lord. And as the author of Hebrews reminds us, we remember those who are in chains as if in chains with them. Please help them. And for those of us, Lord, here today, I pray you'd free us from distraction. For those watching online right now, you just free us from distraction. Encourage our hearts today. Lord, I pray that you'd help me to say only what you want me to say. If there's something I shouldn't say, don't let me say it. If there's something I need to say that I haven't even planned on saying, then I pray that you give me a, a, a word. I pray for a fresh filling of the Spirit in my life. We need you, Jesus. Please help us, Lord. We pray this in your name. Amen. So we are in Matthew's Gospel today, temporarily for this Christmas communion service. A, a, a very famous passage entitled The Birth of Christ. And I, I want to jump right into our text. Uh, starting in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. We'll pause right there. There are by some estimates, 385,000 little babies that are going to get born today. And tomorrow, about another 385,000. And then Tuesday, another 385,000 babies are going to be born. And then another 385,000. I think it's pretty astonishing when I looked up the stats. I didn't know that. 385,000 brand new babies in the world. And, and as it relates to this topic, for those of you who don't know, 2023 was especially significant for me because it was the year that I became a dad for the first time. My little girl, Geneva, she's almost three months old. Uh, I think she's in the back taking notes right now. But if you've never had this experience before, the birth process is filled with some unique things. Uh, as a prelude, there are weeks of morning sickness. Uh, there are weeks and months of fatigue involved. And, and then come hours of painful labor, concluded by the delivery and the birth of the baby, and as a rite of passage for the father, there is usually a very small and uncomfortable furniture arrangement at the hospital. So future dads, do yourself a favor, bring an air mattress with you, you will thank me, I promise you. But I think on this note, one of the great wonders of Christmas is that Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, that he entered human history as a baby. As verse 18 says, the, the birth of Christ took place in this way. That is, as a tiny, helpless, needy baby. That's how he made his entrance. It's, it's kind of mind-blowing when you consider that he was held. He was rocked. He was 
fed, he slept, he did all those things before he ever turned water into wine at Cana, before he ever fed the 5,000 in Galilee. Like, prior to any of this, he was just a little baby. And every December, you know, we'll typically hear stories about the manger, or how there was no room in the inn, or the shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night, or the angels. But man, the crucial part of this story is that not only did God become a man, God became a baby. Tiny, helpless, dependent on his parents, like baby. He became a, a real baby. And the truth of the matter is, he didn't have to. Like, Jesus could have been welcomed into the finest palace. He could have been born of the wealthiest family. The greatest luxury is known to man. He could have had him. Could have. But he didn't. He said he came as a baby. As the Apostle Paul reminds the church in Philippi, it was Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. In the likeness of men, like as a baby. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And so the text reminds us of this very crucial detail. The birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. And it goes on and says, when his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph. And that word betrothed there in the text, it carries with it some certainly different cultural nuances than how we might understand it in the West today. Like probably the closest thing we would consider is maybe like engagement, but even that word is somewhat problematic because being engaged isn't the same thing as being betrothed in first century Palestine. And that's because the betrothal process, very, very serious commitment. In other words, you can't just like break it off. You can't just send an email and be like, I'm done, right? Um, you can't do that. Rather, to terminate a betrothal, that would require actually to go through a formal divorce. And that's because it's really viewed as the first part of marriage, which typically would last for up to a year with the girl staying with her family and her parents, not engaging in any type of like sexual relationship with the guy. And the big idea in verse 18, in recounting the birth of Jesus, is that Mary is pregnant and Joseph is not the father. This is the bluff, as we say in the army. This is the bottom line up front. Joseph is not the father. And that's really important because we know someone's the father. Okay, someone's got to be the father. Like, that's how it works. That's biology. You got a mom, you got a dad, you got a baby. And uh, Matthew's very, very clear on this point. Yeah, it's not Joseph. He's not the dad. I mean, this really has, when you read it at face value, it has all the vibes of being like a daytime TV show. You know, the type of, where they have the episode where they do the paternity test, and you see the videos of the dad, they're celebrating like they just won the Super Bowl because they announced, you are not the father. But here's the thing. If Joseph isn't the father... The question is, who? And the remarkable thing of what Matthew says is, it's the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Third member of the... Tri yes, that's, that's what he says. Like we, 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 We're born hearing this. Imagine how shocking this is. Just imagine, right? If your girlfriend was like, yeah, I'm pregnant, and you're like... But we haven't even held hands. Like, you would be shocked. You would. So, like, I, I, I want to try to bring you into that world, the world that Joseph is in right now in this moment. And he announces, Matthew does, it's the Holy Spirit. It's the third member of the Trinity. This is the answer that Matthew gives for how this could be possible. And this is so crucial to understanding the gospel. This explanation for how Mary could be with child is vital to understanding how it is that one man could die for the sins of billions of people. Because this isn't any ordinary man. Because this isn't any ordinary baby. He was born of the Holy Spirit. He, he is the God man. In other words, this isn't just a virgin birth that is occurring right now. This isn't just a miracle of God taking place. This is a divine conception because this is this is Christmas. So verse 19 continues the story and it says, And her husband Joseph, being a just man 
and unwilling to put her to shame, resolve to divorce her quietly. Let's just hover right there on verse 19. Here's what's going on. Joseph thinks that Mary has cheated on him. That's what he thinks. And he doesn't want her life to be ruined. Uh, So he's trying to find the most dignified way to, to terminate his relationship with her because he fully believes that she's guilty. Uh, what else is he supposed to think? As we already said, like this is basic science. She's pregnant. He's potentially never even like held her hand. So like he knows what's up right now. He knows what's up. And what you need to know is that divorce was actually pretty easy for an Israelite man at this time. He simply had to give the woman a bill of divorce before two witnesses and then send her away. The procedure is actually outlined in Deuteronomy 24 verse 1. And it would seem that this is how Joseph plans to proceed. But what I find interesting in all of this how Joseph handles himself. The text tells us he was a just man. And in addition to that, I I think we can also infer that this guy Joseph's a pretty good dude. Like that's just for the plain and simple fact that there's no mention about his anger or resentment or bitterness in the situation. Now, now, did he experience those things? I, I don't know. Like maybe he did. I definitely would have. And yet whether he did, whether he didn't, The whole focus of this verse isn't on himself, which, let's face it, guys, if your fiancé had two-timed you, I don't think you probably would be overly concerned with her well-being, okay? I don't think you would. As, As much as your own feelings of anger, resentment, bitterness, justice, and yet for Joseph, his main concern is for Mary. Like From his point of view, Mary is in the wrong. Mary has betrayed him, and yet his concern is for her well-being. That's truly remarkable. Like, I don't care what century you live in. Like, it is. Uh, Given the fact that he could have dropped the hammer on her for this, he could have been like, you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you back. He could have been like, I'm going to get even with you. I'm going to burn this whole place down. Heads are going to roll. This was his opportunity, after all, and yet his concern is for His concern is for her reputation. His concern is for her well-being. His concern is that she not be disgraced publicly. And I don't know about you, I'm not sure I could have responded as graciously as Joseph does here. Like, he's incredibly gracious to her. And and in many ways, his response is a foreshadowing of the gospel of the grace of Christ. It really is. He doesn't know anything yet, guys. Like, we know the story, like the complete story. In this moment, he doesn't know any of the stuff that we know. It's a truly powerful pointer toward God's grace to us. It really is. Look at the next verse. It says this, verse 20. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, key phrase, Do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. An angel shows up in a dream to Joseph. And understand this. When an angel shows up in a dream, this would be like if a four-star general showed up. This would be like if the chairman of the Joint Chiefs uh, showed up. But times like a thousand, give or take a couple extra million. So this this is a big deal right now. It carries a great deal of authority because the message that they're bringing comes directly from God. So when they show up, you listen, you listen very, very carefully. And the angel shows up and he tells Joseph, Joseph, you're not the father, but you need to marry this girl. And you can imagine that that's going to require an explanation. Because you know as well as I do, if she's pregnant, but just think about it. From his point of view, if she's pregnant, I didn't touch her, she's guilty. And in this culture, that's really, really, really bad. So how do you persuade someone like Joseph to still marry the girl? Notice what the angel says. For that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And notice the reference again, appearing now for the second time in three verses, it was the Holy Spirit. And on top of this, it is by no accident at all that the angel refers to Joseph as son of David. You see, Matthew is writing primarily to a Jewish audience, an audience that no doubt has certain expectations of Messiah, specifically that he come from David's line. And even though Joseph, he's not going to be Jesus' real biological father, like in a biological way, Jesus is still going to be his legal son. 
and as Joseph's adopted son, he's going to have all the legal rights and benefits of being his son. I could say in the same way that for those of us who know Christ, who love Christ, in a saving way, we have the, the legal rights to be his adopted children. I mean, this is straight up Ephesians 1 5. This is the Apostle Paul, right? In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. And this would include for Jesus the royal right in the Davidic line through Joseph. And so, verse 21, he says, And she. Joseph will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. You're going to call his name Jesus. Literally, Yahweh saves, because that's what he's going to do. He's going to save his people from their sins. And, and the reason this is so significant is because this is our single greatest problem, sin. And, and that's because sin separates us from God. Sin's like a wall, a fence, a barrier. And, and the reason it is, is because of who God is. He's holy, he's righteous, he's pure. He can't be around sin. So sin not only keeps us from God, but here's the other problem. God's also just. And because God's just, he must punish sin. The scriptures are very clear in the book of Romans for the wages of sin is death. He's not talking about a literal death. Everyone dies. He's talking about a forever death, a spiritual death, being separated by that sin from God for all of eternity because of it. That's, that's the issue. And so the angel says, you're going to call his name Jesus because he's going to save his people from their sins. And I get that some people don't like talking about sin. Some churches don't like talking about sin. Some pastors, some chaplains, they don't like talking about sin. But since the Bible talks a lot about sin, I tend to think that it's probably a good idea that we do as well. Since that is the reason that Jesus came. And this is so important because in this context, many would have probably preferred to hear how Messiah was going to save them from something other than their sin. Like if you were to take a poll and ask any first century Palestinian Jew, what's the thing you need to be saved from most? They probably all would have been like, the Romans, the Romans. Because that would have been their biggest perceived problem of their day. Sort of like today, if you were to ask the media, what do we need to be saved from? They'd be like, Donald J. Trump. If you ask conservatives, they would say, the media. If you ask John Kerry or Greta Thunberg, they'd be like, we need to be saved from climate change. If you ask the economy, they'd say inflation. But he doesn't say any of these things. He doesn't say any of the things about the Romans. He doesn't say anything about politics or current events or the economy. Rather, he says that Jesus has to come and save us from our sins. And that's because sin is the greatest problem that we have. And furthermore, you can't defeat this problem by yourself. You can't defeat this problem on your own. You can only defeat this problem if you have Jesus. And so, verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Uh, here, here's what Matthew's saying here. He says, God's at work, guys. God is doing something really amazing. Joseph this isn't Mary trying to be deceptive. This isn't a trick. This isn't manipulation or to get you to marry her and be like the baby daddy. It, it's not that at all. All of this has come about as a result of what has been ordained and predicted by the prophets. And so you say, well, hold on a second. What exactly, what, what exactly was predicted by the prophets, Matthew? Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked. Look at what he says. Here's what, here's what it says. Verse 23, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And, and then when Joseph um, woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son. And he called his name Jesus. Verse 23 is a direct quote from Isaiah. Isaiah. And the name Emmanuel in verse 23 is a name that's just packed with loads of meaning. Literally translated, God with us. And what's interesting about the meaning of his name, God with us, is that it may or may not be good news. So, oh, hold on, hold on. It sounded like you said it may or may not be good news. Yeah, you, you heard right. Well, then in what sense might it not be good news? Like, I thought, you were, I thought you were talking about Christmas, Joe, and baby Jesus coming, and you're saying, this might not be good news? Like, like, how is that even possible? Well, that's because Emmanuel, God with us, has some unpleasant implications for some people. The 
prophet Isaiah in the very next chapter, chapter 8, verse 9 and 10, he says this about Emmanuel. Verse 9, be broken, you peoples, and be shattered. Give ear, all you far countries. Strap on your armor and be shattered. Strap on your armor and be shattered. He literally says it twice in verse 9. And like, no doubt because he's like, wait, wait, we're strapping on our armor that we can get shattered? Normally when you strap on your armor, you're, you're protected. You're not shattered, you know, that's, that's why you strap the armor on. He's like, oh, no, 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 you're going to be shattered. That's why I said it twice because I know you probably thought you misunderheard, misheard me the first time. You didn't. You're going to strap it on, you're going to be shattered. Verse 10, take counsel together, but it will come to nothing. It will come to nothing. Speak a word, but it will not stand, for God is with us. Literally, he concludes with Emmanuel. He says, go ahead and collaborate with other people. Put on your your bulletproof vest. Go ahead, set up your Iron Dome defense systems. It won't matter. You can't escape God. You can't run from God. You can't hide from God. Like He's here right now. He's with us right now. And so the reality is for some that Emmanuel, God with us, brings terrible news of judgment with no escape. And I realize that can be a little bit of a disconnect because Christmas is supposed to be all about good news. I mean, Christmas should be about good news, and yet for some, Christmas isn't good news, and that's because for many, they don't want to be saved from their sin because they love their sin more than the one that came to save them from it. And yet for others, Emmanuel brings life-giving hope. And I think what's super interesting about verse 23 specifically, can we go back to verse 23, please? Thank you. I I don't think I've ever noticed this before in verse 23. It's the part that says, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God's with us. Did you see where it says they? You see it? I, I, I told him to bold it so you could see it. See, I always just assumed that meant his parents, specifically that they, his parents, they'd call Jesus by this name. But see, what's really interesting about this is there's never any mention, anytime, anywhere, in which Jesus was called Emmanuel by his parents. Like, not even once. Like, as far as we know, he just went by Jesus. That was his name, Jesus. So the question then is, well, then who was Matthew referring to by the they in verse 23, since his parents never called him by that name? And I think the answer is that Matthew intends for us to understand this word in the sense that it refers to the readers and to the people throughout history who would call him by this name who would sing songs about him by this name. And furthermore, they refers to the people who will also understand that he is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy and his promise, which says in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel. And then at the end of the gospel, there is the promise, right? In Matthew 28, 20, that Jesus will be with us to the very end, to the end of the age. He really is Emmanuel indeed. But I think to really grasp the significance of Matthew's words here about the virgin conceiving and bearing a son, you you need to go back to the original source material of the prophet Isaiah, who Matthew is quoting here in verse 23 about Emmanuel. You've got to go back nearly 800 years during a time in which the Jewish people lived under two kings following the reign of Solomon, David's son. You've got Israel in the north. You've got 12 tribes of Israel, 10 tribes in the north, two tribes in the south, Judah and Benjamin. Eventually, Benjamin is absorbed into Judah. But that's the time that Isaiah is writing, 800 years before Matthew penned these words. And uh, during this time in Judah, there was a guy named Ahaz who reigned evil King Ahaz. This guy is a dirtbag of all dirtbags. He was responsible for filling Jerusalem with idols. He reinstated the worship of Moloch, which basically just was the precursor to Planned Parenthood. He even burned his own sons as human sacrifices to that pagan god. And so yeah, not a very good guy at all. And so here's what takes place leading up to Isaiah 7.14. Pekah the king of Israel in the north, Rezin, the king of Syria, they they get together and they collaborate. They're like, hey, listen, we should have a regime change. I agree. 
let's, let's get Ahaz out of Judah and let's put someone else there that'll do our bidding. All right, let's, let's, let's do it. That's their whole plan. And you think when King Ahaz and Judah hears this, it would be a wake-up call, right? You think. Like, like maybe he would repent. Maybe he would seek God. Like, no, not at all. Like, instead of running toward God, Ahaz runs away from God into the arms of another king, a guy named Tiglath Pileser, the evil Assyrian king. And then to make matters worse, Ahaz rips off gold and silver from the temple. He basically takes all the money from the offering from the church's bank account and then sends it to the Assyrian king to try to garnish favor dealing with the Syrian king and the northern Israel king. And so enter the prophet Isaiah, chapter 7 of his book. Isaiah comes and he tells Ahaz, God's going to deliver the people not from one, but from two enemy kings. And of course, Ahaz, being Ahaz, totally refuses everything he says. So in response, Isaiah responds with a remarkable messianic prophecy in chapter 714, which Matthew is quoting right there. Isaiah was telling the wicked king that no one would destroy the people of God or the royal line of David. That's the backdrop when he says, the Lord shall give you a sign. And the you, the Lord shall give you a sign. Like in the original language, that's a plural indicating that Isaiah was also speaking to the entire nation, telling them that God would not allow Rezin and Pekah, the northern king, or anyone else to destroy them in the line of David. Like no matter how bleak the situation might be right now, Like, being teamed up on by the northern king in Israel, who essentially are their relatives, God's going to be with them. That's the backdrop to verse 23. That is the historical significance that Matthew is drawing upon as source material to punctuate the arrival of King Jesus. He is with us, no matter how bleak it might look right now in your own life, no matter how dark it may be, God is with us. This is what it means to have Emmanuel. This is what it means to have Christmas. And the remarkable thing is, when God came to save us, he could have came in any fashion at all. Could have. He came as a baby to live from infancy a perfect life. And if you have kids or you've ever been a kid, which I think applies to pretty much everybody, like we no doubt experience these, these moments in life when it, it can be really frustrating sometimes. Like when you're trying to do the right thing, when you're trying to obey God, like in the middle of temptation, then you just end up messing up. You end up giving into that sin that you're, you're battling or you're fighting. Like, this is what the author of Hebrews has in mind, is encouraging us with the following words. He says, For we do not have a high priest, Jesus, who's unable to sympathize us with our weaknesses, but one who, in every respect, has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. We have two choices to make at Christmas. Run to God or run away from God. And that's what Hebrews just told us. Like we, can, we can draw near the throne of grace so that we can receive mercy in our time of need, or we can do what King Ahaz did and just run away from God by looking to someone other than God to help us and fix us. And this is what the good news of Emmanuel is about. God is with us. This is what Christmas is about, guys. And that means in those moments where you, you couldn't be perfect, someone else was for you. In every place, in every stage of life where you have failed to keep the rules and where you messed up, he succeeded. And for those of us who accept this truth and love this truth, instead of being punished for the wrongs we've done, God gives us his righteousness. This is what the word imputed righteousness means. He, he gives us his perfect score. And so this Christmas, we give thanks to God for sending his son Jesus, who became a baby, just like each of us, so that we might become his adopted children. As the team comes, I want to pray for us. We thank you, God, that you are Emmanuel, that you are God with us. Lord, and I pray that that wouldn't be bad news 
for those of us listening right now, that that would be glorious good news. Lord, I thank you for sending us your son, Jesus, to come and save us from the biggest problem that we have, that we can't take care of and fix on our own. And I pray that everyone would know this truth. Everyone here today, everyone hearing my voice, Lord, for our, for our unsaved friends and family members, that they would know Emmanuel, that they would know your son, Jesus, in a saving way. I thank you for the, the glimpses of the gospel throughout this story in the life of your servant, Joseph. Lord, I thank you for all the good and kind things that you've given to us. I pray that we would treasure the gift of your son. I pray that this Christmas, it, it, thinking about your son wouldn't be like some buzzkill, but it would be the, the most glorious thing about that this most momentous day. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. We owe you everything. We pray this in your name, amen.